the reason why I've always been driven is because um, no one, I always felt like no one is paying attention to certain things. And because there was all these gaps that I identified as like, oh, if they need to be addressed, I'm the one who's going to have to do it. Hi, and welcome to the LeadDP podcast. I'm your host, Lennox Wasara. Can you believe it? We are in our fourth episode of the third season. Really excited because this season we've been focusing most of our conversations around progress and growth. And we hear from our alumni from the University of Pretoria who have really been sharing some truly insightful stories. And today I am joined by somebody who truly embodies the idea of progress and growth. Muno Guata, who is uh, really passionate about finance and also passionate about financial education. She even started a FinTech and Fin Education company at the age of 19. Think about that, really, really young. But whilst she was at the University of Pretoria, she managed to acquire an LLB qualification. Uh, that's from our law faculty. Keep in mind, our law faculty is the best in Africa. It's been ranked number one in Africa for the past six years. And this year in 2023, we're ranked 78th in the world. So that's truly incredible, speaking to the quality that's being produced from the University of Pretoria. But her legal aspirations have paved the way to, for her to be able to be an attorney at Weber Wenzel in you know, her journey. And at some point, that was what she did. And uh, she's also been very well known for her TED Talk, her article writing, which has been seen on several, several publishing houses. And most importantly, she's also an entrepreneur. She's also been involved in the World Economics Forum's Global Shaper uh, entrepreneurship program, which is truly exciting. And presently, she's working as a principal consultant that's with IQ Business. And she joins me today on the Lead UV podcast. Welcome, Muno. It's good to have you here. Thanks. I'm really excited to be part of this and really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, going through your introduction. And I realized that you are a self start of note. I mean, you've been so ambitious from an early age. Uh, how did you become so eager? I think um, one of the best things is I've always been open to learning and I've never put any limitations on what you're able to do. Um, if you're not able to do something, we live in a great age where you can learn everything online. So everything I kind of like self-taught and I was open to being willing to explore these opportunities. Finance, I didn't study finance. Um, so even with an LLB degree, I've been able to transition into the tech space and it's just by being willing to learn and be open to those opportunities. If you're a self-starter like that, if you teach yourself like that, you don't procrastinate much because, you know, there's nobody driving you and say, hey, read this, read that, go look for this, go look for that. You just work on your own independently. I think um, for me, the reason why I've always been driven is because um, no one, I always felt like no one is paying attention to certain things. And because there was all these gaps that I identified as like, oh, if they need to be addressed, I'm the one who's going to have to do it. So that kind of drove me to be like, well, no, especially like, for example, financial literacy. This has been a problem that's generational, right? Like people aren't told about their finances, but it's a problem that continues to persist. People end up like not being able to manage their finances. We go through a recession. Everyone's panicking, not because maybe they don't earn enough. They just don't know how to manage that money. We can't blame anyone because it hasn't been taught, right? And I could go around and say, we need to teach financial literacy or I can be the one who you know, takes that lead and starts teaching it and creates that platform. So I've always been like, you know what, instead of convincing everyone to do it, kind of do it yourself. When did you read your first financial literacy content? Like how old were you? Oh, so I've been really fortunate that my parents were kind of very um, adamant about financial literacy from a very young age. So even when I was like about 10 years old, my mom had a principle that if you save about like, depending on like a thousand rand, she'll match it with a hundred rand or oh, something nice. like that. So that kind of already started building the, that, I guess, that eagerness. And then also like they, my mom was very big on like saving, investing, having passive income. So I was really exposed to that at an early age. So even like in my early teens and I was already learning about, you know, Richest Man in Babylon, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the classics. Yeah, I read um, that book as well. <laughs> so, and I always kind of saw, you know, like I, I noted that people were kind of in a, in some kind of trap, right? Like you work really hard, but you don't have that much. You feel like you're working for everyone, then you're not really getting the benefits of that. And this idea of like, oh, you can make more money by investing it. It always, I was very keen at an early age to be like, oh, you know, if I can retire early and not have to be kind of chained to this very, you know, the system, the cycle of constantly working, constantly trying to get more in a very limited box, then I'm really keen for that. That's learn how to do that. That's what I was really, um, I guess, attracted by. Yeah, that's nice. So take us through the entrepreneurship journey. I mean, I'm keen to know how this went about for you. So at 10, you're learning about financial content. Your parents are very supportive in the journey. And then at 17, you start really getting into entrepreneurship. Tell us about what you were doing and how that rolled out. So I think it, it really was just um, be being just 
kind of taking, listening to all the signs, I guess, if I can put it that way. It started off with a very random conversation that happened when I was in high school. Someone had mentioned that their dad had bought them some shares or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, wait, like I always had this idea that to buy shares, you have to go to some banker and it's a very exclusive process. And I was like, wait, you can actually just buy these shares like from a listed company. And I read about it, but I didn't actually know how to go about doing it. So I went home and I like told my parents, well, I want to own shares. Um, and my parents were more like, you know, because most people invest in property and property is a very expensive way to invest, especially yeah. as a teenager, there was no way I was going to start <laughs> investing in property. But like shares, if I can like put 100 rand, 500 rand a month, that can eventually go a long way. And I wanted to build that habit. So I went home and was like, I want to buy shares. No one knew how to do this. So okay. your they, folks also figuring it out as well. Yeah, they, okay. they don't know how to, to buy shares. Um, from the Janusburg Stock Exchange. So I was like, wait, like no one knows how to do this. So I start like researching about it. I'm not getting a lot of information. And that time it was it was a very we didn't have like easy equities, or at least it wasn't as popular as now it was now. So I'm writing emails to like very fancy brokers saying, Oh, like I wanna um, learn how to invest shares and these people thinking this kid is crazy. You know, at that time you had to invest a minimum, I think, at least like hundred thousand or big amounts thinking this is ridiculous and i'm like actually like people don't have information on how to start investing how to get involved like i don't think i'm the only one who wants to buy shares and i started asking around like how and it just was a common answer oh i don't know how you do that but yeah it's a good idea right so that was kind of what started that um, conversation and I was still a minor at the time so I had to like ask my parents yeah. can you help me open an account um, I do want to start investing and they were supportive again they, they, they gave me a few thousand rand just to be like okay um, you know go for it and, you know you and I didn't know what I was doing so you're buying you just like oh I know there's Sassel <laughs> yeah, buy some buy. Sassel shares not knowing if it's a good um, time to buy or not and then you just start learning right you start saying okay well like the share, these shares are going down, my investment's not too good, how can I learn more? And then I was like, oh, well, if I can start sharing this information, that would be very, very helpful. So that's kind of what, what started that, um, how the journey started. And then FinTech was very much about yeah. payments. Let's, let's help people make payments across the continent, especially in Africa. It wasn't really focused about investing and in building wealth. Um, compared to now, this, this landscape has changed. Um, in the US, you have like Wealth Simple and you have all of these Robinhood, these kind of platforms that are geared towards helping people start investing. So I started to see, okay, like, this wasn't such a crazy idea. Yeah. And it's not building traction. Like I started with a blog and people would be like, there were comments in the comment section. Like this is so What helpful. was your first blog about? So I used to, be, well, I still am a big um, believer in investing in like ETFs. Okay, ETFs. Um, okay. And uh, for me, the concept was amazing that you can get this basket of like all these different shares and you just invest in that one ETF and you get exposure to different industries. Uh, what are ETFs? Just simplify it. Um, so an ETF is basically a basket of shares or different investment. Um, assets already picked out for you. Okay. So for example, you can get an ETF of the top 40 um, shares listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So those would be the largest companies listed on the Johannesburg. Those the all share. Yeah, so okay. you, can, you can get something like that and you can invest in that. So I was writing about ETFs because I was learning about it. And I was like, this, like, if you want to invest in property, they're like property ETFs. If you want to invest in stocks or commodities, there's ETFs for that. So I was like, oh, this is really cool. But I didn't know about this. How many other people don't know about this? How can I help spread that information? And I always felt like, because I only really got into it around 17, 18. And that's yeah. kind of when I started investing. I was like, if I knew about this earlier, I would have done it like five years of investing, even 500 rand would have been the great, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know? So I felt like I had missed out on a lot of stuff and I wanted to help other people who could have, you know, get that information and start using it for themselves. So you launched the blog, you start putting this content out there. So what do you start, what feedback were you getting from people who are actually engaging with your, with your content? People were just like happy to get the information and I have to be honest, like the first website, when I look at it now, I always like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I think that's part of being an entrepreneur, right? Like sometimes it's not about um, being ready or waiting for the best moment to start, right? Because there is never going to be a best moment. It's kind of just going out there to the market and seeing the response. So people would be like, oh, you know, I think um, we should have more content about this. Because like my content was a bit all over the place. I'm talking about investing, um, how to invest. Sometimes I'm talking about like some random news event. Like some, I think at the time there was a, there was some trade wars happening. So I was also speaking about that and they were like, no, we don't like this content. I'll be like, yeah. took me a week to write it, but okay. Um, so it was just, and then taking that feedback and seeing how I can 
improve. And that time I wasn't, I didn't have any like software engineering skills. So I was using like templates from WordPress to put out the, the content. And like sometimes there was limitations on how accessible that was. So I started saying, okay, like I'm getting feedback. Like people couldn't open it on their phone. It wouldn't be as responsive. Then I started like saying, okay, what can I learn to improve this? And then that opened another door of opportunities, just being open to feedback and learning more on what I can improve. Yeah, because I can imagine it must have been exciting for you at the time, going back to your friends in school and saying, hey, I've got this, if you heard of shares, I'm actually starting to buy shares and, yeah. you know, looking at all that. And people kind of put you in a box, so to speak, where they think, you know, you are the financial expert or you're the investing expert. Do you feel like you have that level? Like, do you carry that level? Do people feel like you know everything about investing? It's quite interesting because I always get somewhat boxed. It's like, oh, she either knows about finance yeah. or she's either a legal person. And legal, I, 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 even though I trained in that, I don't really feel like I'm the voice on authority on legal matters. But when it comes to finance, I do think people will definitely hit me up and be like, oh, yeah, so I want to get like 10% or 20% return in like two months, which is not really feasible. Um, we want that advice and even in i think now within my career i do get that like okay you work on finance you're going to be in that space um so there is that boxing but i mean it is a specialization of focus that i'm happy to be in the financial sector because i don't think there's enough yet focus on making finance accessible and making it as inclusive as possible making it accessible make it inclusive what are you learning about people's perceptions about money uh, with you running Kukura Capital, what are some of the things you're learning there? Must be quite interesting. I know when I started, this is a weird thing. Everyone's like, yeah, you know, you, you're doing this blog and you're doing about, you're doing fintech and financial literacy and um, financial inclusion and helping people investing and saving their money. No one's interested in that. That's what, that was what I was told. It's like people aren't, this is not a, a focus point that, uh, that people think about. And then I've since learned that's not the case, right? Like, the amount of people who really do want information and want assistance on managing their finances yeah. is crazy. Like even now people call me, they either be listening on a radio show, or even I know Netflix has this new sh series, how to, be, how to Be Rich, which is just about financial literacy essentially. And people are like, you know, I just, I wish I knew certain things earlier and I wish I knew these things sooner. And even like you get called like radio shows where people are calling like, how do I manage my money? And what I have learned is people really do want the tools to manage their finances. You're also giving not only adults tools who are trying to adult, um, you also written a book for kids uh, around financial literacy. Tell us about that. I think it just goes back to um, my exposure to finance. I really am grateful that I got um, I had parents who kind of made me aware of financial literacy at an early age because I do think that's the best um, time to kind of start training people or getting them in that mindset of how to manage their finances because every time I have a conversation or I get feedback from people they always say I wish I knew this sooner right yeah. there's stuff that I've learned about since that you know even when people start working they get a salary and they don't know what to do with it right and then three years down the line, they end up in not the best financial position in spite of having those opportunities to be in a better position if they knew just what to do. So I think teaching um, children at a young age that that's one of the benefits and also building that confidence. We don't have a culture yet in, I believe in South Africa, that's really focused on entrepreneurship. Um, we're more inclined to be career focused, career driven. And yeah. I, I also, I know the security of that. I mean, I'm myself kind of, transitioning out of having the full-time job to going full-time entrepreneur but it's also like building people with the confidence if i knew what i knew in terms of entrepreneurship earlier i think it would have been a different path i would have taken so i kind of want to give people those tools to know look this is a viable thing right like we don't ever see those stories of how you can be a full-time entrepreneur we always see oh go work in a company be go up the ranks there and that's the route to success but there's different ways to do it yeah, you just described hybrid entrepreneurship. I think that you're a clear example of that, a person who's one foot in corporate, one foot for their own enterprise and trying to transition out of it. Uh, speaking of those transitions, uh, how do you navigate the, I guess, the mixed identities that come with uh, being a corporate and then now you're the boss on the one side? I mean, is it a bit of an identity like journey for you? I think it always depends on the environment. I think um, 
for, for me, I feel like having that entrepreneurship background has helped me a lot in my career. Um, just kind of being a lot more bold in some of the moves I take. But also there's a, I guess there's a, there's some boundaries or some limitations in the sense that when you own your own business, you know, like you have skin in the game. When yeah. you have a career, you kind of don't have as much skin in the game. You have your fixed salary. It doesn't matter how much you increase the, the, the profits of the business. It's very unlikely that you're going to get a direct share of that. So I think especially like when I think about like, you know, share ownership, dividends and stuff like that, your career is very limiting in that regard. But I think having an entrepreneurial background and mindset is applicable in any environment. I think people and it's the nice thing about it, you get to test the waters without so much risk. Like you can learn certain skills in your corporate job without having the risk of like if you try to for the first time just saying present something and you yeah. haven't never done that. You'd rather do it in your corporate space, learn there and then take that learning to your business. So it has that that benefit as well. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or you feel like the mindset has developed over the years? Because listening to you, I feel like you're somebody who's sort of curated that entrepreneurial mindset through your journey. And some people also sit back and say, well, I think entrepreneurs are born. I'm just not an entrepreneur. We're like, no, you can attain the entrepreneurial mindset and you don't have to start a startup. You could use that in corporate because there's a sense of entrepreneurial yeah. mindset required in, in corporate as well to do well. Yeah, I think you can definitely it can be developed over time. Uh, I think for myself, when I was really young, I mean, it's 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 a weird situation because we are very much framed into what our expectations are in terms of becoming successful. Yeah. Even when I had to pick a formal career, it was based on what I was told is a very what a successful route you be this this or that and I think because of that I also had a I didn't have exposure to the possibility of being an entrepreneur so even if you like don't feel like oh this corporate job is for me sometimes you don't know what are the other options so I do think it's something that you can develop over time definitely and you can be open to an entrepreneurial mindset even if you you want the security of you know a corporate job or a more traditional route but i think you know you have to also as much as people like that security you only get like amazing results when you take the risks and yeah, you, yeah. you know so listening to you i hear a lot of like taking risks and security calculated risk now obviously at the end of the day most of us work our jobs and many of us do what we do because at the end of the day one financial security yeah. uh one financial freedom so Talking about financial freedom, what do you think is the best way to attain it? Because I think of myself, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed to say this. I'm 26 and haven't, I'm not financially free yet. But I mean, somebody probably listening thinking, hey, what's the best way to be actually financially free? Like, how do you actually track your progress? That's a very valid question. Firstly, what age do you need to be yeah, financially yeah, I, I didn't, free? I feel like I'm moving too slow. <laughs> no, no, no. And also, what? how do you get there, right? So that's kind of been the biggest thing. How do we visually track this? So that's kind of what we've been working on um, in Steve, that we're kind of, it's once we go live, we'll be able to kind of expand on that. But it is a tool, which would be an app that helps you actually see what stage I need to focus on. So what happens is, there's a lot of elements to financial freedom, your savings, your earnings, your investing, and also your debt management. So it's not about like, I think it gets overwhelming, right? Do I invest first? Do I pay off all my debts? Do I save? How much do I save? When do I stop saving? And it's definitely a journey, right? And it's a, and the best, the thing with finance, it's supposed to be very boring. So it takes some time. It's like, you know, you have a goal, maybe at 35 or 40, yeah. that's when I want to be retired. Obviously you can exactly make it a lot f faster depending on what you're doing. If you, you know, how much risk you're willing to take. But the healthiest way is to make sure you minimize your debt, don't be over indebted, which is like a huge thing that we're currently dealing with from a, from just the stats. A lot of people are over indebted. We're talking about 70% of their income paying why, off. Why do you think that is? Is that because like I see a car I like and I'm like, oh, I would look nice in that car. I see those clothes, oh, I would look nice in those clothes, but I just actually don't afford them. Like, why do you think so many of us are in debt? It's twofolded. It's um, mostly um, not having a good understanding of exactly what is debt. Like, yes, you may qualify for a debt, but what does that imply? You're going to pay a lot more than what you take out. The interest rates are very high. And how are you using this? Because debt can be a good thing, definitely. Yes. If you're using it to invest in property and then you're getting some returns on that, if you're using it to further your education. But yeah, it is, oh, I want this car. I qualify for it. Yeah. Just because you qualify for it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best decision. And there's a billion payment waiting for you at the end. <laughs> yeah, and it's like a lot of people want to, I, I guess it's like, oh, I didn't have this. Now I have access to it. So I want it now. I live one. Right, and it's also you have to balance. You know, I always get scolded by a lot of people because I'm very 
like frugal about certain things but i do think that can be helpful but a lot of people just don't have the weren't told just because you qualify for something doesn't mean you should get it people don't have that um education about about debt but it's still fine right like the per the point is just being able to understand your current situation and being able to move from that so reducing your debts um making sure that those are cancelled because you don't when you have a debt you're paying someone else right making sure you have an emergency fund that's why people get in debt they don't have any savings mm. something pops up for a rainy day your car breaks down now you're getting a loan that loan is going to be interest is going to be charged it's going to cost you more than if you had savings which you could draw down from so having an emergency fund having savings a lot of people don't have savings like of even 10,000 rand which is its own thing so focus on those two things once you have like your debts paid off obviously large debts you can keep cuz normally the the interest rate won't be that bad like if you have a mortgage it's over a long period of time those on the debts you're prioritizing but credit card debt that stuff has like personal debts those things are, are, yeah. are just bad waters to be in um once that is sorted cuz that takes about 3 5 years of getting rid of right then and at the same time you're building your savings then you can start saying okay i need to generate passive income and money that's going while i'm doing something else and that's when you start investing and there's different ways to invest you can invest firstly you got you want to do the tax free um investing so you can at least get some benefits from that so you invest in some etfs that are tax free then once and there's limits and ranges in which you can do that at so it doesn't have to be too complicated like invest in something solid that you understand that you feel comfortable with and then these shares will start growing cuz these companies are growing or oh, you you may not want to invest in the South African listed ones you can invest in the 500 listed ones in the New York Stock Exchange but you can do that through an ETF and it's tax free so you do that and then you let that money grow so you it's just about being consistent right like compound interest is your friend yeah. Warren Buffett 80% of his wealth just from compound interest true i mean listen to you i mean i'm like thinking you probably don't make bad financial decisions i don't know if there's any that come to mind No I mean for me I think one of the things that I learned from working is that working is more expensive <laughs> than people acknowledge <laughs> like I think there's a lot of I mean it's um there's a good book on the millionaire next door and it talks about that I remember reading it cuz I you work with people um who are supposed to be earning a lot of money I've been exposed to people in high amounts of money but you just felt like this isn't translating right they telling you about you know financial strains that you think okay but if you earn this amount of money what's what's and lifestyle inflation is a real thing right when you start working in a certain job you have to appease a certain i guess that environment like it's a cost right so i think that's something that you always have to be cautious of just because i have this job doesn't mean i have to have x y and z i think that's something which everyone just has to be mindful of and i also know like when you start working you're young you're like oh my gosh i need x y z cuz that's what everyone's doing but keeping your distance and i i mean for the most part i'm very frugal um but i'm always aware that you know in certain spaces just be aware okay this isn't necessary just because of an expectation because of that career or and uh, just in short before i wrap this up what does a principal consultant actually do in your current work now a yeah, principal consultant is just more of a technical role so i work in the tech space yeah. um so i do help uh, mostly banking clients with digital transformation so that's kind of building mobile applications or web application that helps kind of improve their ex- i guess the accessibility to their clients so making sure that a banking product is more accessible through a digital platform so it's kind of like that's mostly what i'm doing just helping them with that from a design perspective and implementation perspective just from a practical saying this is the best way to do that and uh taking it back home uh where it started at the university of pretoria uh, what about this institution helped you to grow and to make so much progress that you've described in this uh episode in our conversation yeah i think i was really fortunate to be at up at the time that i was because there were innovation labs there were like so many initiatives at the time i think it's still happening i just you know um initiatives around business there's a business incubate incubator so sure. from a very technical perspective they would help you understand the elements of entrepreneurship from a practical perspective what you need to do customer acquisition all of those like technical things i really was able to um absorb that and also just being in a culture that really was like we want people to be innovative we want people to be um entrepreneurs i think that really was something that i appreciated just having access to that lovely to speak to you i've learned so much about finance and how you're helping so many people i think you uh, one day you're going to be sitting somewhere and someone will be like hey i once read your book and uh, i'm a millionaire because of that so i would love that yeah definitely yeah 
I think that's probably the goal. But thank you so much uh, for joining us here on the LDP podcast. That does bring us to the end of our conversation today with uh, Muno Guata. I could have gone on and on. There's so much to, to learn from and so much to hear. But uh, do remember to catch our podcasts on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen, uh, or visit our website, up.ac.za forward slash lead up. You'll find more updates over there. But we're keen to hear your feedback. We're happy to get your reviews and your thoughts and who you think will be our next guest as well. But uh, do remember that this podcast is probably brought to you by the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Office and our Head of Content is Samantha Castle. Alna Schutz is our producer and our sound engineers and video videographers are Maropa Communications. They are bringing you this wonderful audio quality as well as the visual quality. But uh, till we meet again, hopefully you will be financially free. Goodbye.